This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and healthful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org. It's great to see so many faces here and to see some of the people who have attended our diabetes education. I'm so happy to see you here. Now this talk has been approved for registered dietitians continuing professional education. So there were some dietitians that called and were not able to get in tonight because we were full. So now I'd like to introduce Brenda. Brenda is a registered dietitian, as John said. She is a leader in her field and an internationally acclaimed speaker. She's worked as a public health nutritionist, clinical nutrition specialist, nutrition consultant, and academic and nutrition instructor. So she's got a wide range of experience and background. She is the past chair of the Vegetarian Nutrition Dietetic Practice Group of the American Dietetic Association. She's the author of five wonderful books, and, and she has several of her books here tonight. She's got her Defeating Diabetes book, which she came out with and was presented at the uh, Dietetic Conference two years ago. Uh, without further ado, I would like to introduce Brenda Davis. I'd also like to ask Jasmine Westerdahl to come up. Thank you. This is so beautiful. And thank you all for coming this evening, and thank you so much for inviting me. This is uh, just such an incredible experience to be here. And I've learned a new word, aloha. So aloha, everyone. We are going to be talking about defeating diabetes. And we are going to begin with the most simple question, what is diabetes? I think most of you in this room probably know what it is, but we're going to review it anyway. It is basically a disease in which the body fails to produce or use insulin properly. And insulin is simply a hormone that's made by your pancreas that allows sugar to be used by your cells for energy. If you don't have enough insulin, guess what happens? Your blood sugar levels rise. And all sorts of things happen to your body that we don't want happening. There are two major classes of diabetes. Type 1 diabetes, and you know that's about 5 to 10% of cases. You may remember what type 1 diabetes used to be called childhood or juvenile onset diabetes. This is a disease that involves complete destruction of the cells that produce insulin called beta cells. So it leads to pretty much an absolute insulin deficiency. It is a, an immune mediated disease and it's what we call idiopathic. We really don't know the cause. There may be many different causes of this disease. By far, the more common type of diabetes that we see is called type 2 diabetes. This is about 90 to 95 percent of the cases of diabetes. Do you remember what we used to call type 2 diabetes? Adult onset or maturity onset diabetes, and we called it that because we rarely saw this type of diabetes in people under the ages of about 40 or 50 years. Today, it's a different story. This is a disease in which we have insulin resistance and or reduced insulin secretion. It is generally adult onset, but not always, and it is caused 
by underactivity and overconsumption most of the time. This shows the stages of the metabolic stages of type 2 diabetes, and I just want to review this quickly. Diabetes begins with something called insulin resistance. This is a condition in which you produce plenty of insulin. Your pancreas is working just fine, thank you very much. But guess what? The insulin, for some reason, doesn't work properly. It could attach to the receptor sites, but just not do its job, or it may not even be able to find the receptor sites on your cells that it needs to attach to. What happens when we have insulin resistance you might be able to guess what happens if you know what insulin does, but basically you end up with this thing called hyperinsulinemia. What's that? Well, basically, when your insulin isn't working properly, the sugar in your blood builds up because it can't get into your cells. And what happens is a signal is sent to your pancreas saying, Send us more insulin. We need more insulin. So your pancreas starts hyper-producing insulin. Okay? So at this stage, no problem with insulin production. You're producing plenty. But what happens eventually is what we call impaired glucose tolerance. We just can't produce enough insulin to keep up. We end up with this thing called defective glucose recognition which means that your, your pancreas just stops recognizing that the glucose is built up so much. So it stops putting out all, the, all that hyper high amount of insulin. And you end up with this thing called early diabetes. Okay? And this is the stage, I wrote this book called Defeating Diabetes. This is the stage at which, in some cases, not all cases, we can actually reverse the disease. Once we, this continues for a while, we end up, your, your pancreas just ends up conking out. It just can't keep up. It's trying hard, but it can't. So you end up with this thing called beta cell failure. The cells that produce insulin just stop working. And you end up with late diabetes. At this stage, the disease is no longer reversible, but we can do a lot to help you control the disease. Type 2 diabetes is truly the modern epidemic. It affects about 8% of North Americans. The percent of North Americans with something we call metabolic syndrome, which is actually a pre-diabetic condition, but get this, 15 to 25 percent of the North American population have this pre-diabetic condition. The increase in type 2 diabetes in North America between 1958 and 1997, it has increased six times. People in their 30s, it has increased between 1990 and 1998 by 70 percent. Unbelievable. Newly diagnosed children and teens with type 2 diabetes, and I'm talking about when a child is diagnosed with diabetes, about a third of the time they actually have type 2 diabetes, not type 1. It used to be that less than 2% of children that were diagnosed with diabetes had type 2 diabetes. Now it's a third, and this is very frightening. This was a disease that we only generally saw in older people. Now we're seeing it in four-year-olds, six-year-olds, eight-year-olds, ten-year-olds, and almost 100% of the time it is in very obese children. Let me tell you a little bit about metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance syndrome. You may even know it by the name Syndrome X. This pre-diabetic condition involves at least three or more of the following symptoms. A waist measurement of over 40 inches in men, 35 in women, triglycerides of over 150 milligrams per deciliter, an HDL of less than 40 milligrams per deciliter or 50 milligrams per deciliter in women, a blood pressure of over 135 over 80, 
and fasting blood sugar of greater than 110 milligrams per deciliter. Now, for those of you that don't know, do you know what HDL is? High density lipoprotein. Okay, and a lot of people call this good cholesterol. Okay, high density lipoprotein. And have you heard of low density lipoprotein? We call that bad cholesterol. A lot of people get confused over this and they think there are two different kinds of cholesterol. One, one's bad, one's good. That's actually not true. There's only one kind of cholesterol. This HDL and LDL are, are like dump trucks. They're carriers of cholesterol. LDL is the bad dump truck that takes cholesterol and dumps it onto your blood vessels or into your blood vessels causing plaque formation. The HDL is the good dump truck that helps you get rid of cholesterol. So we don't want to have low levels of HDL. We want high levels of HDL. They're very protective. Okay? So if you have three out of these five things, you would be diagnosed with metabolic syndrome or insulin resistance syndrome. It's important to recognize the consequences of type 2 diabetes. Type 2 diabetes is actually the fourth leading cause of death in North America. Your risk of renal failure increases about 17 times, risk of blindness 25 times, amputations 15 times, cardiovascular disease 2 to 4 times, nerve damage is experienced in 60 to 70 percent of patients, and your life expectancy drops about 5 to 10 years. Is type 2 diabetes the luck of the draw? Very rarely. It is largely a disease of diet and lifestyle, as I mentioned, underactivity and overconsumption. The incidence, and this is the shocking thing, ranges from almost zero in some populations to as much as 50% of populations in others. So it, that for a lot of people is just shocking. How can it be that there are some people in the world where type 2 diabetes is almost unheard of? But in fact, there are several places. And what we know is that the lowest incidence of this disease on the planet exists in populations who live simply, are physically active, and eat a diet of unprocessed, high-fiber plant foods. The highest incidence is seen in populations who in generations past lived that way. They lived the simple life. They were very physically active. But they have since adopted a very high-fat, processed food, affluent-style diet and have become sedentary and overweight. The, the folks that are at the very highest risk have this, what we call an apple shape, where they carry most of their weight in their trunk as opposed to their limbs like their legs. And in fact, they have what we call high levels of intra-abdominal or visceral fat. You know some folks that have stomachs that are very large and hard? When you have a very large hard stomach, you're carrying a lot of the fat in and around your vital organs as opposed to what we call subcutaneous fat, which is loose fat at the surface of the skin those people actually have a lower risk than the people with the large, hard abdomens. And metabolism tends to be fairly efficient. These are people that generally have fairly low energy needs, and so in the face of famine, they do very, very well. In the face of abundance, as we experience here, they don't do so well. They're at very high risk for chronic diseases. And there was a study done that I thought was quite interesting looking at the risk of type 2 diabetes in women. And they compared women who were, who were very slim with a, what we call a BMI of less than 22. A BMI is your body mass index. It's a measure of body fatness. And if you have a BMI between 20 and 25, that's considered normal, or 19 to 25. If you have a BMI between 25 and 27, that's considered sort of your yellow light zone. 27 to 30 overweight, 
above 30 obesity, above 35, what we call morbid or extreme obesity. Now, they compared people with a BMI of 25 to almost 27, 26.9, and their risk was 8.1 times higher than people with a slim body or a lower body fatness. Now, I want you just to notice what happens as BMIs go up. People with a BMI of over 35 have a 93.2 times increased risk of type 2 diabetes. It is a direct, very, very direct association between level of body fatness and risk of type 2 diabetes. Now, if you look at type 2 diabetes in vegetarian populations, we have one study called the Seventh-day Adventist Health Study, and many of you may be familiar with that study. It's provided us with some of the, the best stats we have comparing vegetarians to non-vegetarians. And in this study, the risk of diabetes in male vegetarians versus non-vegetarians, 53% lower in the vegetarians. In females, 55% lower. And in people that were between the ages of 50 and 69, which is really our very highest risk age group, 76% lower in the vegetarians. We have many studies that have looked at very aggressive treatment with plant-based diet, diets, and we have found that these kinds of high-fiber plant-based diets not only significantly improve the markers of health with relation to diabetes, but in some cases they actually completely reverse the disease. And this just gives you some idea of the number of studies. The latest study that was done was done by some of the PCRM physicians, the Physicians Committee for Responsible Medicine. They had just amazing results with a fairly moderate fat or low fat vegan diet. And this just says if you don't change directions, you will wind up where you're heading. And with type 2 diabetes, I can tell you one thing. Where you're heading is not a great place. And it's really, really difficult. And I can appreciate how difficult it is to make changes. But just understand, you can't change directions 5% you'll still end up vaguely where you're heading. You need to make a complete about face. You've got to make major lifestyle changes if you want major results. And that's what I'm here for. I want to teach you how to be as aggressive as you possibly can with this disease. For many people, it is defeatable, but you've got to make the right kinds of choices. Our goals here, we need to protect against heart disease because that, that is what kills most people with type 2 diabetes. We've got to promote healthy weights and we've got to achieve and maintain blood sugar control. But ultimately, what we really want to do is restore insulin function by overcoming insulin resistance through major diet and lifestyle changes. So tonight, what we're going to focus on is fine-tuning the diet. We're going to look at carbs, fiber, fat, and protein. How can we fine-tune each of these dietary components to maximize protection? And first, we'll look at carbohydrates. And I'll tell you, I truly believe this is the number one nutrition blunder that many, many people make, whether they're meat eaters or whether they're vegetarian. This is something we need to work on. The issues here are, number one, do we need to minimize carbohydrates? And number two, what are the best and worst sources of carbohydrates for people with diabetes? Well, should carbohydrates be minimized? No. Because when we minimize carbohydrates, we maximize protein and fat, which can cause problems, can increase our risk of disease, especially heart disease. Well, we have to control carbohydrates. The source of the carbohydrates is actually more important than the proportion of calories derived from carbohydrates. And I'll go into this a little bit more. What are the best sources of carbohydrates? 
simple, whole plant foods. When carbohydrates come, come from unrefined plant foods, they are consistently protective to human health. The lowest rates of type 2 diabetes on this planet are in areas with some of the highest carbohydrate intake, 65 to 75 percent of calories from carbohydrates. The most successful interventions we have for type 2 diabetes use fairly carbohydrate-rich diets. We're not looking at low-carb Atkins-style diets. What are the worst sources of carbohydrates? Refined sugars and starches. When carbohydrates come from refined sources, they are consistently damaging to human health. They increase our risk of obesity and our complications associated with obesity. They adversely affect our blood sugar control and they increase insulin resistance. They reduce protective HDL and they increase our triglyceride levels. So what am I talking about here? What are refined and unrefined carbohydrates? Well, refined carbohydrates involve two categories of foods. Simple carbohydrates called sugars, like white sugar, brown sugar, candy, soda pop, and complex carbohydrates called starches, like white flour and white rice products. Now, we used to, as dietitians, teach people Simple carbohydrates are bad and complex carbohydrates are good. We now know that that's not really true. There are plenty of complex carbohydrates like complex refined starches that are very damaging to health. And there are actually some sugars that can be very protective. When they come from unrefined sources, the sugars in fruits and vegetables are not so damaging to human health. There are unrefined starches that come from whole grains, legumes, nuts, seeds, starchy vegetables that are good for health. The difference is, in the first category, the refined carbs, we are taking a perfectly good food and removing almost everything of value to human health from that food. Whereas with unrefined carbohydrates, the foods are packaged with protectors like fiber and phytochemicals, everything that we were intended to get from that plant. When we take a food, like a grain of wheat, for example, and we refine it into white flour, which makes up m as much as 70% of the calories in some people's diets, we are doing something to that food. You know what wheat is made of or what it is composed of. There's really three parts. The bran, the germ, and the endosperm. What we do when we make white flour is we remove two of those three things. We remove the germ and the bran. Well, do you know what the germ is? It's literally the storehouse of, of nutrients for the kernel of wheat. That's where the vitamin E is. That's where the phytochemicals are. That's where the B vitamins are. That's where many trace minerals are. We take that away. Then we take the bran away. What's bran? Well, that's where a lot of the fiber is, some of the trace minerals. These are two protective components. What are we left with? Endosperm. And what happens in the process is we remove 80 to 90% of the fiber from this food, 70 to 80% of the vitamins and minerals, and 95% of the protective phytochemicals. But we don't stop there. We, who eats white flour by itself? First, we add a bunch of damaging things to the white flour before we eat it. We add salt and sugar and hydrogenated fats and chemicals and preservatives before we eat it. So it's not that we're just taking away good things. We're adding a bunch of bad things. This is not what we want to do. I want to add another caution about processed foods. High fructose corn syrup. Have you ever heard of it? It's in many, many things. It is a very common sweetener used in soda pop, fruit drinks, breakfast cereals, baked goods, all sorts of processed foods. In the United States, over 40% of the sweeteners added to foods and beverages are fructose. High fructose corn syrup, primarily. 
our use of high fructose corn syrup has actually increased a thousand percent between 1970 and 1990. And we are getting a lot of good solid research to show that fructose used in this refined form, we all know fructose is in fruit, but when it's in fruit, it's also packaged with fiber and other great things. But in the refined form, fructose increases triglycerides, increases insulin resistance, and contributes to overweight and obesity. This is not something that you want in your food. If you look at the top sources of carbohydrates among U.S. adults, yeast breads, soft drinks, cakes, cookies, donuts, sugar, jam, jelly, potatoes, ready-to-eat cereal, pasta, rice, milk, flour, and baking ingredients. White flour, 95% of it is white flour. Take a look at that list. Can you understand why we have some of the problems we have the only unrefined carb in this whole list is right here, potatoes. Unfortunately, most people are not taking in most of their potatoes as baked potatoes or steamed potatoes. They're coming in the form of french fries and potato chips. Bad news. So what are the recommended carbohydrate intakes? If we look at the World Health Organization's most current recommendations for maximum disease risk reduction for diabetes, they recommend 55 to 75% of energy from carbs, but they specify unrefined carbs. Free sugars should never be more than 10% of energy, and that's for the healthy population. What is less than 10% of energy? Well, that's less than 13 teaspoons a day in a 2,000 calorie diet. And a lot of you would say, wow, 13 teaspoons, that is so much sugar. Nobody could eat that much sugar in one day. Well, in 1909, people actually consumed about that amount of sugar. They actually consumed about 11 teaspoons a day or about 38 pounds of sugar a year. Well, in 1997, we ate an estimated 154 pounds of added sugars a year, or 46 teaspoons of sugar a day. That's about 25% of our calories. That is not good news. We just can't be taking in sugar at that rate, added sugar at that rate. There was a recent study done of school children that showed that children consume just one beverage, if they added one sugar-sweetened beverage, a soda pop or a fruit beverage that was sugar-sweetened to their diet, they would actually increase their risk of obesity by 60%. So how much sugar do we get from foods? Well, if you take a look at this list, a slush, which is one of those ice drinks with the sugar water added, uh, a medium-sized, which is 32 ounces, 28 teaspoons of sugar. We go down here to low-fat, well, let's go to soda, 12 ounces, 10 to 13 teaspoons of sugar. I don't know about here, but where I live in British Columbia, we go to the theater, and a small soda is 20 ounces. A medium soda, I think, is 28 a large soda is maybe 34 or something like that. Imagine the amount of sugar that people are taking in when they're consuming these beverages. And if you order a large, if you order a large pop and popcorn, it's bottomless. You can refill it all night long. It's just unbelievable. We just are supersizing everything. But one of the things we have supersized more than anything else is our beverages. When I, I went to Belgium to speak at their National Nutrition Conference a couple of years ago, and the first time I ate in a restaurant, I was served, I, I ordered a little sparkling water, and it was in a six-ounce bottle. I thought, I, I thought it was a joke. I just had never seen a beverage that small. And that's the size they serve of sodas and everything there. But in North America... 
it's it, we have gone to such extremes and those extremes are costing us hugely you look at north american obesity rates 65 percent of the population are overweight or obese when we supersize foods we supersize people in the process i just want to point out the low-fat fruit yogurt seven to ten teaspoons of sugar in one container one small regular container so very very high in sugar if you're eating a lot of these sweetened foods you're taking in a lot of sugar practical pointers here number one rely on whole plant foods for most of your carbohydrates what are we talking about vegetables fruits legumes different kinds of beans intact whole grains nuts and seeds we want to moderate our intake of what we call healthy processed foods we've got to learn to read labels even natural organic or whole grain foods may have unhealthful ingredients added like hydrogenated fats many whole grain products you will see whole grain listed on many breads and if you read the ingredients the first thing in the ingredient list will be wheat flour and a lot of people think great wheat flour wheat flour equals white flour if it's not white flour it will say whole wheat flour okay so you want to look at that label and if it says wheat flour you know that's not a good choice for you how should we be eating our grains if we're eating grains well this is just a little hierarchy so that you can try you can go from the bottom of the ladder and try to work your way up keep taking steps in the right direction the very best you can do intact whole grains what am i talking about i'm talking about things like wheat berries kamut berries spelt berries brown rice barley uh, oat groats quinoa these are intact whole grains what do you do with them very best thing you can do with them is sprout them soak them overnight in some water and let them sprout for a day or two that is the basis of my breakfast cereal every day sprouted whole grains i eat them with fruits and nuts and seeds and they're really truly quite wonderful the other thing you can do is cook them slowly in a crock pot overnight that's another great way of using them you can just add a little bit of fruit a little bit of nuts and seeds try to experiment look for recipes with real whole grains there is nothing added there is nothing taken away that's how we need to be eating them second best would be broken whole grains and here we're talking about thing uh, about things like red river cereal 12 grain or 7 grain cereal next on the list would be rolled whole grains things like oatmeal rolled barley rolled rye and those are still whole grains but they've been rolled so they will lose a little bit of their value and they will be a little more highly absorbable they'll affect your blood sugar a little more than an in an oat groat for example versus a rolled oat so you want to try to take steps towards those intact whole grains next on the list would be our shredded whole grains like shredded wheat cereal and followed by flaked whole grains like our flaked whole grain cereals that are not highly sweetened and finally our puffed whole grains like puffed wheat and puffed rice now have to tell you this list we're not even ta- we're not even getting close to some of the highly processed things like sugar frosted flakes and count chocula those don't even rate to be on this list but as far as whole grains are concerned move your way up to the top i think this is one of the most significant steps you can take towards improving your blood sugar control just an amazing difference it, if you want to go as aggressive as you can possibly go no broken grains whatsoever eat only intact whole grains and watch what happens you will be amazed we also of course need to minimize our refined carbs 
The processed foods made with white flour, added sugar, our sugar-laden beverages, and our starchy, deep-fried snacks like chips and fast foods. So let's move on. As we're talking about carbs, I want to very briefly talk about the glycemic index. Have you ever heard of the glycemic index before? Most of you have. Some of you may use it on a regular basis. What is it? It's simply a measure of the effect of various foods on blood sugar. Okay? So how much does a food affect your blood sugar levels? Foods are actually compared to a test food, and the usual test food is glucose. And glucose has a glycemic index of 100. And so what we do is we give someone 50 grams of carbohydrates in the form of of glucose and we watch what happens to their blood sugar curve and we actually measure the area under the curve and then we give them 50 grams of carbs from carrots or whatever food we're testing and then we watch what happens to the area under that blood sugar curve. Glycemic index is a useful tool but it should never be used in isolation and let me explain that. If you compare the glycemic index of some very unhealthy foods, like potato chips, with some foods that are very healthy, you will find that the unhealthy foods actually have a lower glycemic index than the healthy foods because they may be high in fat, very low in carbs. So we need to consider many other things about the foods, not just their glycemic index. Now, the other thing you need to know is there's an, there are an awful lot of factors that affect glycemic index, the type of sugar. For example, if you take in pure glucose, it has a much higher glycemic index than table sugar or sucrose. And that has a much higher glycemic index than fructose from fruits. The type of starch, amylose versus amylopectin, a lot of people think all starch is the same. It's not. If a food has a higher level of amylose, it'll have a lower glycemic index than a food that's rich in amylopectin. So that's a little complicated. The amount and type of fiber present, if it's got a lot of fiber, it tends to have a lower glycemic index. The form and density of the food. You can take two foods made with white flour. You can take pasta and you can take white bread. The pasta has got a low glycemic index because it's so dense. If you cook pasta al dente, which is fairly firm pasta, it has a lower glycemic index than if you overcook the pasta. So even two foods with identical ingredients practically will have very different glycemic indexes. The presence of fat in the meal will lower glycemic index Cooking and food processing, the more we cook, the more we process, the more easily we absorb the sugars from the food. So the higher the glycemic index. The ripeness of food, a ripe banana has a higher glycemic index than an unripe banana. The acid content, vinegar lowers glycemic index. Lemon juice lowers glycemic index. So, so I just am showing you all of these so that you can understand that it's not as simple as it might seem. Many, many factors affect glycemic index. Now, if you look at the glycemic index of a food, the way glycemic index to me is valuable is if you're comparing similar foods. For example, you want to compare all your different whole grains barley with rye with oat groats you can compare and you can concentrate more for example millet has a higher glycemic index than oat groats or barley so you can use the oat groats and barley a little bit more so that's how it's very useful but you can see Intact whole grains have a fairly low glycemic index. Pasta, fairly low glycemic index, but it's still a refined carbohydrate. So there are reasons why it's a far lower choice than what an intact whole grain would be. Uh, rice, fairly high. Bread, very high because it's so light and fluffy. Legumes have a low glycemic index. The legumes with a lot of fat have an even lower glycemic index like soybeans and peanuts. If you look at dairy products, it's interesting. Dairy products actually have a fairly low glycemic index. However, they seem to have more of an impact on insulin secretion than what would be 
assumed based on glycemic index. So there's some interesting research coming out on that. You can look at chocolate with a glycemic index of 49 because it's so high in fat. Does that make chocolate better than brown rice, which would have a slightly higher glycemic index? Not a chance. So we just have to be aware of that when we're looking at this. We'll just go right down here to sugars because I want to point out sucrose has a glycemic index of 65. Do you know sucrose is table sugar? I want you to just pay attention to this. Bread, 70. Table sugar has a lower glycemic index than bread. And people go, no way, that's not possible. It actually is possible, and it's one of the reasons why a lot of people teaching about diabetes have gotten less stringent about the use of table sugar as part of your cooking, part of your meals. In my opinion, the, the, better, the better conclusion to come to would be we need to really watch all refined carbohydrates. Okay, not just sugars. We need to watch equally the refined starches. Okay, and the reason why bread has a higher glycemic index than sucrose is because sucrose is half fructose, half glucose. So it gives it a bit lower glycemic index. When bread, the starches in breads are broken down and absorbed, they are more glucose than what table sugar is. So it, it's all complicated. The main bottom line is really, if you use glycemic index, please don't use it as the be-all and end-all. It really isn't. It is one tool in your arsenal, okay, just one, and it needs to be used with that in mind. When you look at glycemic index ranges, we're looking at anything with a 55 or less being low, 56 to 69 medium and anything with a 70 or higher being high. Now what is even more valuable than glycemic index is something called glycemic load and glycemic load just it, it basically factors in the amount of carbohydrate you're eating. Okay, so glycemic index doesn't factor in the amount of food you're eating and that is hugely important. So the glycemic index is the amount of carbohydrate times the glycemic index. Now carrots, for example, have a very high glycemic index. And so a lot of people think, well, I shouldn't eat carrots. But they actually have a very low glycemic load because their total carbohydrate content is low. You have to eat a lot of carrots to get that 50 grams of carbohydrates. It has a glycemic index of 71. So that's high. But the glycemic load is 6.4. And if you look at glycemic load ranges, glycemic load of 10 or less is low. So that's another thing that really does need to be taken into consideration. So let's move on to fiber. The issues here are how much fiber is needed to provide significant benefit to glycemic control. And secondly, what type of fiber will really be most effective in your diet? Well, when we look at the amount of fiber in the diet, 10 to 20 grams is average for most North Americans. Very little impact on your blood sugar control at that level. 20 to 35 grams of fiber is what most professionals are recommending. The American Dietetic Association, the American Diabetic Association recommend 20 to 35 grams a day. But what we have found at this level, level of fiber intake is we get some benefits to, to blood sugar control, but less than what we thought we would get. And what studies have shown is you need to be up and around 35 to 50 grams of fiber a day to have any real significant effect on your blood sugar control and to really make an impact on hyperinsulinemia. The ADA again recommended 20 to 35 grams a day. However, they clearly acknowledge in their diabetic guidelines the benefits of much higher fiber diets but they question the palatability. They question the gastrointestinal effects and the long-term acceptance of very high fiber diets. The World Health Organization recommends more than 25 grams of fiber a day, 
but I quote from their most recent document. However, the wide range of studies quoted here suggest that an appreciably larger quantity is required to reduce the risk of diabetes or to improve glycemic control in those with the disease. There was a study done that actually demonstrated very clearly that high fiber diets are very well tolerated and accepted. The study actually compared moderate fiber intake 24 grams a day with high fiber intake 50 grams a day. Both diets were very well tolerated, very well accepted. And the researchers concluded that a high intake of dietary fiber, particularly soluble fiber, above the level recommended by the ADA, improves glycemic control, decreases hyperinsulinemia, and lowers plasma lipid concentrations or blood cholesterol levels in patients with type 2 diabetes. I think we already said this. Vegans average 40 to 50 grams of fiber a day and are basically where they need to be with fiber intake. Vegans are people that don't eat any animal products at all. Soluble fiber is the type of fiber that is especially beneficial if you have diabetes or if you have heart disease. It's the most effective type of fiber for controlling your blood sugar response. It's the most effective fiber for lowering your blood cholesterol levels. The major sources of soluble fiber are legumes or beans, peas, oats, flax seeds, and some other fruits and vegetables as well. Practical pointers here, go for 35 to 50 grams of fiber a day. That means you're aiming for at least 10 grams of fiber per meal. To get 35 to 50 grams of fiber, you would need to eat about five servings of whole grains, a couple of servings of legumes, and these are your most concentrated fiber sources. You need to be including legumes in your daily diet. A one serving of nuts or seeds and eight servings of vegetables and fruits a day. Our best sources of fiber are whole plant foods. Eight or more grams from legumes and high fiber cereals. But I want to tell you something, please do not think that you've got fiber beat by sprinkling all bran on your morning breakfast cereal. And, and the reason I say that is all bran is mainly insoluble fiber. It helps keep you regular. It doesn't help with your blood sugar. It doesn't help with your blood cholesterol levels. It's one type of fiber. We need all the types of fiber from many types of plant foods to provide the kind of benefit we want. The other thing is if you are a vegetarian or if you're eating a plant-based diet, when you sprinkle wheat bran on your cereal or on your other foods, you are sprinkling phytates on your foods. And phytates are our greatest inhibitors of mineral absorption, of phytochemical absorption. So we're doing ourselves a huge disservice by doing that. We want to maximize our absorption of protective compounds, not minimize them. So we, we really do negatively impact our health when we sprinkle wheat bran on a plant diet. We get enough fiber by eating all of the good whole foods we should be eating. Poor sources of fiber are refined foods. We get very little fiber from processed foods. Fiber-free foods, animal foods, sugar and, and fat, no fiber at all. No fiber in meat, poultry, fish, no fiber in dairy products. Moving on to fat, the issues here, what are the most harmful and the most healthful sources of fat in the diet? How do people with diabetes ensure that they get enough essential fatty acids? Issue number one, the fats you need to avoid. They are saturated fats and trans fatty acids. Saturated fat there are so many problems with consuming too many saturated fats. First of all, they increase total and bad cholesterol. They increase triglycerides. They increase blood clotting factors. They reduce glucose tolerance and insulin sensitivity. They contribute to narrowing of the blood vessels and to kidney disease. 
How much should we be consuming? The recommended intakes less than 7% of calories for people who are at high risk for diseases, for overweight, for diabetes. That's less than 16 grams of saturated fat per day. So our average saturated fat intakes in non-vegetarians, about 10 to 14 percent of your calories come from saturated fat. That's almost double what it should be. Vegetarians, about 8 to 10 percent. And vegans, people that don't consume any dairy or eggs, 4 to 7 percent of calories. So they're bang on where we need to be. Where do we get saturated fat? Well, our major sources are animal foods. Dairy products, 60 to 66 percent of the fat in dairy is saturated. Meat, about 35 to 50 percent. Poultry, about a third. Fish, about 20 to 30 percent. One minor source for most people, tropical oils. Coconut oil is about 90 percent saturated. Palm and palm kernel, about 50 and 85 percent saturated. Now, why do I say they're minor sources? simply because only about 2% of our fat comes from tropical oils. Okay. Tropical oils, are they any different than saturated fats from animal foods? They're not packaged with cholesterol. The size of the saturated fat chain is a little different. They may not be quite as damaging. And what we've seen globally is people that use some tropical oils, if they're eating a high-fiber plant-based diet, no negative consequences to health that we can see. But you would want to use, if you're using them, it should be moderately. Okay? The fat in most other plant foods is 5 to 20% saturated. This uh, little cartoon says milk is full of fat, beef is full of fat. I don't want to hurt you anymore, Cliff. I think it would be best if we went our separate ways. <laughs> What are the top sources of saturated fat in the U.S. diet? Cheese, number one. Beef, milk, oil, ice cream, cakes, cookies, and donuts, butter, shortening and lard, salad dressings and mayonnaise, and poultry. So what foods contain saturated fat? Remember the upper limit, 16 grams a day. A chocolate eruption cheesecake? One piece, 38 grams. Six ounce T-bone steak, 15 grams. One ounce of cheddar cheese, nine grams. If you eat two ounces of cheddar cheese, you are over the top for saturated fat. Satur cheese, if you think of cheese being 75, 80% of calories from fat, this is a block of saturated fat. It really and truly is. Beware of cheese. want you to notice the foods in gold at the bottom. These are very high-fat plant foods, avocados, nuts, seeds, tofu, olives. But look at the levels of saturated fat by contrast between 0.6 and 2 grams in a serving. Very, very minimal. In fact, if you eat a completely vegetarian diet, you could eat all of the following foods and you would still be consuming less than 10 grams of saturated fat, 10 servings of fruits and vegetables, 8 servings of whole grains, 2 servings of beans, a serving of tofu, 2 servings of soy milk, full fat, regular soy milk, an ounce of nuts and an ounce of seeds and you would still be under 10 grams of saturated fat. Trans fatty acids. Trans fatty acids actually are very, very bad news for people with diabetes and for the general population. Trans fatty acids are fats that actually get into your cell membranes. Did you know that your cell membranes are essentially fat? Okay. What we want in our cell membranes is essential fats. When trans fatty acids, they compete against 
the essential fats and they actually take the place of the essential fats on the cell membranes. And what happens in the process is they actually change the structure, the permeability, the shape and flexibility of our cell membranes. They contribute to insulin resistance and they effectively dumb down our cells. They make our cells stupid so they can't work properly anymore. They increase our cholesterol levels. They increase our risk of heart disease. So what are trans fatty acids? Where do they come from? How do we make them? They are basically unsaturated fats that have been turned from liquid oil to a solid fat. So that we take a curved molecule, an unsaturated fat molecule, and we turn it into a straight rigid molecule. And that straight rigid molecule behaves much more like a saturated fat than an unsaturated fat. Trans fatty acids can also be formed naturally by bacterial fermentation within the intestinal tract of ruminant animals like cows. If you look at trans fatty acid sources, 90% come from the partially hydrogenated vegetable oils we eat in processed and fried foods. Margarines, shortenings, these are the things we use in baking. We're adding trans fatty acids to our foods when we do that. It is very difficult for people that eat processed foods to stay under two grams of trans fatty acids. Our foods are loaded with these things, and in all honesty, if any food's a poison to the human body, this one's it. Practical pointers here, get most of your protein from plant foods. Whole grains, a couple of servings of nuts and seeds, one of each would be optimal, and two to three servings of legumes every day. Aim for at least 35 to 50 grams of fiber and include good sources of what we call viscous or soluble fiber in the diet. Minimize your refined carbs and processed foods. Rely mainly on plants for your protein. Moderate your quantity of fat, but focus on quality. L avocados, nuts, seeds, olives, best choices. Make sure you get enough omega-3s. And finally, make physical activity part of your daily routine. Aim for an hour a day. You don't have to begin with an hour a day, but work towards that. Begin slowly. Include a balance of cardiovascular strength and flexibility exercises. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much for coming. Thank you so much. Drive carefully, and Brenda will be at the book table to answer questions and to sign some books if you're interested in purchasing. Thank you very much. This program is brought to you by the Vegetarian Society of Hawaii, a nonprofit organization dedicated to sharing with the community the many benefits of a vegetarian diet. Free monthly meetings include vegetarian experts found locally and on the mainland, quick and easy cooking demonstrations, and helpful and delicious food samples. Members enjoy an informative quarterly newsletter, social activities, and discounts at many vegetarian-friendly restaurants and health food stores. For an application, call 944-8344. That's 944-8344. Or visit our website at www.vsh.org. vsh.org.